The polygons are formed by the ice wedges. The ice wedge is an ice-filled crack. The crack forms during the very cold parts of the winter when the soil in between the cracks is shrinking. And this happens at temperatures below minus 10 degrees Celsius. These cracks, they stay slightly open until spring snow melts. The water from the snow runs into those cracks and then freezes right there. And then it slightly expands. And the expanding causes the soils to be pushed away. So every year the crack goes roughly in the same place and more water comes in and so slowly the ice wedge becomes bigger and bigger. Permafrost, uh, by the most common definition, is it's kind of a geophysical definition, it's based on temperature. So it says any earth material below ground which at or below zero degrees Celsius for two or more years consequently is permafrost. People are surprised to hear that sometimes, you know, in the high Arctic it even can get up to 20 degrees Celsius. But that heat doesn't travel all the way into the ground. It travels only on average half a meter into the ground. That's what we call the active layer. And so the active layer thaws every summer and it refreezes every winter. We need to know, of course, more, not just temperature, but also how much ice in permafrost, how much carbon is sequestered in permafrost. So here you see how the pattern of the ice wedges is tied in with the pattern of the surrounding lakes. And in this case, if you start losing some of these rims, you could call it thermokarst because the water that is close to these ice wedges gets warmer because of the sun and it can erode away the ice wedges and it starts caving in, we call that thermocars. So that's a very interesting part of studying permafrost to study these processes of disintegration of permafrost, which could be very rapid if there is significant amount of ice in the permafrost. If there is not too much ice in permafrost, we can still have some process of uneven settlement of the surface. We still can have development of thermocarst and thermocarst lakes even, but generally these changes will be much less noticeable than if there is lots of ice and permafrost. This is a close-up of the white dots and those are non-sorted circles. I think they are very fascinating features in the tundra because they are created by the interaction between the ecosystem and the physical environment. They kind of work together to enhance each other. So without the plants, there would not be any non-sorted circles. And without the physics of freezing and thawing, there would not be a pattern. The way it works is that you have these barren patches surrounded by vegetation. Every winter when it gets cold, the ground freezes and the vegetation, it slows the freezing down. But the pear patches, they freeze first. And what happens is you get water being attracted by that freezing because the freezing is kind of like drying. And so the water wants to go into these non-sorted circles. And what happens is they start to rise every winter and so they rise every winter and then in summer they collapse again and this process of rising and collapsing actually prevents the roots from surviving in the center of these features and so it's the symbiosis of you know plants growing around it providing insulation but they don't want to grow in it because they get damaged from that strong action of frost heave Most of carbon stored in the permafrost in form of organic material. It's remnants from vegetation, practically. Just accounting the area which is covered by these kind of sediments and summing them together, it could provide very significant numbers. There is estimates which were made lately of uh, carbon in permafrost, which shows that right now in the upper three meters, there is more carbon, twice more carbon in the frozen state than it is in, in the atmosphere. So that's pretty big amounts. Probably will not happen anytime very soon, <laughs> but if it will release, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere could be tripled. <laughs> we see this continuous warming in our coastal sites in permafrost, somehow related to 
more open ocean during the summertime because it's increased temperature, but also it increased precipitation. Snow is a very important component for permafrost because it, it keeps it from cold winter conditions. So if you have more snow, generally permafrost is warmer and much less stable. The degradation of permafrost could happen easier. I think we see already this interaction between more open waters during the summer and degradation of permafrost in the coastal sites. In general, of course, the whole Arctic system will change with changes in ice distribution, and that will affect permafrost as well.